Today, we will be blessed by an intellectual giant whose work have inspired us and have been helping us in carrying out our instruction. Our, our speaker for today is an emeritus professor of education at the University of Southern California. He is known for introducing various hypotheses related to second language acquisition, including the acquisition learning hypothesis, the input hypothesis, the monitor hypothesis, the effective filter, and the natural order hypothesis. He is indeed a prolific writer, having authored 500 or over 530 articles and books in the field of bilingual education, neurolinguistics, second language acquisition, and literacy. He is a multi-awarded scholar, having received the Mildenberger Award in 1982 for his book on second language acquisition and second language learning, the Pimsleur Award given by the American Council of Foreign Language Teachers for the published article in 1985, the Dorothy C. McKenzie Award for the Distinguished Contribution to the Field of Children's Literature, a Doctorate of Humane Letters awarded by the Lewis and Clark College in Portland in 2011, and the Kenneth S. Goodman in Defense of Good Teaching Award from the College of Education, University of Arizona just last year. Most recently, our speaker promotes the use of free voluntary reading during second language acquisition, which he says is the most powerful tool we have in language education. Everyone, let us all welcome Professor Stephen Krashen. Good. Thank you, Joey. You forgot the most important award. I tried to tell you, but you didn't remember. This is more important than all the others. In 1976, before your mother was born. Right. <laughs> I, <laughs> I won the Venice Speech Weightlifting Championship for the incline bench press. And you didn't mention that. Oh, I missed that out. That's been the best. Me. My father was helping me. Can you imagine what a thrill that was? Anyway, yeah. getting back to the less important things, I'm going to talk about fiction. And I'm going to defend fiction. There was a big debate in the United States about 100 years ago in the field of library science about fiction. And I would like to read you a little bit of what one of the critics said. This is by a guy named Herbert Putman, who wrote this in 1890, 1890, even before I was born. Talked about libraries. He said, our public libraries must draw the line absolutely at what they believe to have educational value, or they will lose the confidence of the better minds of the community. I do not mean to exclude merely flabby literature. The flabby is a first step removed from the vicious. Our American public hardly needs to be convinced into reading. It reads too many books, not too few. Boy, that was the days. So I have a whole bunch of articles from there about people who talk about the evil of unlimited fiction. The United States government took this position too. About oh, 15 years ago, they had, oh, a terrible idea. My goodness, they, they had something called the Common Core for Language Arts. And the Common Core insisted that we put more emphasis on nonfiction. We want children in school to read nonfiction so they can become engineers and scientists and compete with other countries, etc. It was a mistake, a terrible mistake. I've been looking at the research on fiction over the last few years, probably about the last seven, eight years, and I'm amazed at how powerful fiction is. Fiction is the path, in my opinion. It's more fun, it's easier, and it works much, much better. Everybody watching was and is a fiction reader, and you don't have to be forced to do it. You do it because you want to. I want to, uh, before I go into research, I want to tell one story, which uh, gives some of the data about my cousin Evelyn. Let me tell you about Evelyn. Evelyn is now 93 years old. When I was a little boy, Evelyn was wonderful. She was my friend. 
go to her house and be with her and her wonderful, her wonderful husband, Marty. We'd play music and talk, everything a little boy needed. She was also my mother's best friend. So I need to honor Evelyn. A little while ago, Evelyn said, you know, I always admired my husband because he knew so much about the law. He had gone to law school. He wasn't a lawyer, but he knew everything about the law. She said, that's very important. I want to learn about the law. I'm going to go to the university and take a class on being a lawyer. And I said, Evelyn, maybe I got another idea. Why don't you read some novels, some fiction? Read some novels written by John Grisham. I had read a lot of John Grisham novels. I used to listen to them in the car. My hypothesis is 10 John Grisham novels is like a year of law school. Evelyn, of course, followed my suggestion. She has been spending her time reading novels. I've been sending her novels and getting them in the mail through Amazon and all that. And she's called me up and she says, I absolutely love these books. They're incredible. And I'm learning so much painlessly about how the legal system works. This is a very good exam. Tomorrow when I talk to Evelyn, I'm going to tell her what I told you. Well, before we jump into this, we have to do some preliminaries, some fundamentals. I have to give you my standard sermon about how language is acquired. I think some of you are familiar with a little bit of it. Uh, the last, oh gosh, the last 40 years has been remarkable. Our ideas about how language is acquired have changed remarkably. We now think there are two ways of getting better in another language. You can acquire language and you can learn language and they're very, very different. Language acquisition is subconscious. While it's happening, you don't know it's happening. And once you're done acquiring, you're not always aware anything is there. It's stored subconsciously in your brain. It's called picking up a language. You say, well, I went to Spain for a couple of weeks and I picked up some Spanish, not by study, that really means you acquired it. I think we are very, very good at language acquisition. Human beings are made to acquire language and we can do it our entire lives. The ability to acquire language, pick up languages easily, never goes away. I'll give you some examples. I have a friend, you might have heard of him, his name is Steve Kaufman. Steve Kaufman is what we call a polyglot. I checked on him today. He now speaks 20 languages. Can you imagine? And he wasn't born with all these languages around. He did them through life. He has acquired eight of them since age 62. I've been with him speaking these other languages. At a meeting of the foreign language group, we went to lunch with my Chinese teacher and her friends. He was wonderful. They were so impressed. I've been with him at Spanish restaurants. I hear him talking to everybody. My Spanish isn't so bad. I, he's really good. I heard him. I gave a lecture. No, I attended a lecture, a webinar on my favorite topic, which was all about my theory of language acquisition. Someone else was talking about my work and they gave it in French. And of course I understood it completely and I found the subject very interesting. Steve Kaufman was in the audience, raised his hand, asked brilliant, insightful, complicated questions in unbelievably good French. He's the real thing. So you can do it at any age. The ability to pick up language does not disappear. It's there forever. The other process is learning, conscious. We do this in school. It's called grammar. It's called knowing the rules. It's knowing about language, conscious knowledge. Now, that the brain is not very good at this, let me tell you. Uh, and yet this is what we've been pushing in school. It doesn't work very well. We struggle with it and yet we continue to do it. Um, error correction helps learning, conscious learning. You make a mistake, someone corrects you, you're supposed to change your idea of what the rule is. So it's related to learning. The brain is very bad at learning. The brain does learning very poorly. It acquires language very well. It learns very, very poorly. Amazing facts about language acquisition. First amazing fact, how does it happen? It happens in only one way. There's only one way to do it, by listening, and understanding. 
If you are reading something in another language and you understand the message, if you're having a conversation and listening to another person, you're getting the language. If you're reading and you understand what you're reading, you're acquiring the language. More amazing fact, and by the way, I think this is the only way it happens. Uh, the other methods don't even help. It's, they're nearly a waste of time, studying grammar, trying to talk, etc. Language acquisition is effortless. It doesn't take hard work and grim determination. Simply read a good book, have an interesting conversation, and you're acquiring even more exciting. It happens whether you want it or not. It's always going on and you can't stop it. If you are reading a book and acquiring the language, you can't turn off the language acquisition device. It's always gonna be operating. Now, in fact, if I speak to you in another language and you understand what I'm saying, you are acquiring, you can't help it. We are made to acquire language. We can't shut off language acquisition like we can't think about it and shut off our kidneys. We can't think about it and shut off our lungs. It's part of us. Well, if this is true, some very interesting things follow from it. Uh, a guy named Leonard Newmark had this idea. He said, if this is right, it means that you have to pay attention to what other people are saying. You have to pay attention to what you're reading. You have to really listen to them. Now, it's, when, I, when he said that, I realized it's a lot easier to pay attention if what the other person is saying is interesting. That led me to another part of the theory. Interesting is okay. Very interesting is even better. Hypothesis, optimal for language acquisition, is when input is compelling. So interesting, you forget that you're listening to another language. A couple other facts and that will help us define what the best input is. Language acquisition doesn't happen all at once. It's very slow, it seems slow to us, it's gradual. In fact, researchers from the University of Illinois have done a number of studies and their conclusion is that each time you see a word in context or you hear it, you get a little bit of the meaning, just a little if you understand what it means. You have to hear it again, again, again in a slightly different context. Each time you see it or hear it, you get about 5% of the meaning of the word. So you need to hear it a lot. This leads to the requirement that we want input that is, Benico Mason's term, abundant. There has to be a lot of it, so you have a lot of chances to acquire. Dr. Mason has also said optimal input, the best input should be rich. This means two things, they're related though. If you're reading a book, you want a whole book to be fascinating and you want it to be colorful and with interesting detail and move the story along. You want it to push the story forward. You want someone talking to you to push the conversation forward. We want language that does that. It keeps the input more interesting and it helps language acquisition because it makes things more comprehensible. Let me give you the new hypothesis, folks, and I'll summarize what I've said. For language acquisition to happen, we want comprehensible input. Optimal input, the best input, the most efficient input for language acquisition should be comprehensible. It should be compelling. It should be rich and it should be abundant. There should be a lot of it. I thank Benico Mason for emphasizing this. She claimed she got it from one of my books I wrote in 1982, but I had forgotten it and she brought it back and uh, made it very, very vivid. This means that some kinds of comprehensible input are better than others. Just saying something's comprehensible input isn't enough. It's gotta be compelling. There has to be a lot of it and it has to be rich. Okay, classes we sometimes say, well, we'll just uh, sing some songs. Is that a good way of giving people comprehensible input? It'll work eventually, but I don't know if it's optimal. Songs aren't always optimal. 
Sometimes they're not very interesting. They don't contain a lot of language. The language is not abundant. And the language isn't especially rich. I think I should sing a song for you, okay? Sorry, it's too late. You can't leave the room. Um, the song is a good example of input that is comprehensible, but that's about it. It was a very famous rapper song. It goes like this. This is why, this is why, this is why I'm hot. This is why, this is why, this is why I'm hot. This is why I'm hot. This is why I'm hot. You ain't because you're not. This is why, this is why I'm hot. Now that's funny and it's interesting and you can get a nice tune with it but it's, you're not gonna get much language acquisition from it. You need a lot more interesting input, I think. Now, immersion, <clears throat> immersion uh, is a very interesting word. I think we should stop using it because it's, you don't know whether it's optimal input or not. I had a year of very optimal immersion. It was wonderful. I was a music student in those days. No, I won't sing for you, I did already. Um, I actually did piano, it's very exciting, but I didn't do well with my music lessons, with my piano teachers, but the input was optimal otherwise. When I came back to the United States, I spoke German quite well. The input I got with, from my friends, I had lots of friends that were both from Austria and from other countries, I was in Vienna. I read a lot. My friends and I exchanged books and talked about them. I went to the movies all the time and gradually I could understand them, etc. So the input I got was comprehensible, it was rich, and it was abundant. It was wonderful. Not always though, Dr. Mason has done some very interesting uh, studies where she's examined, in one case, a, a former student who was, a, I'd say, advanced intermediate uh, in Japan studying English. And she went off to Canada where she had a job. She had friends. She stayed with an English speaking family. She didn't do any reading. She grew five points on the TOEIC, that's all. She went back to the university, did intensive reading, intensive listening to stories and made very good progress. So the input was concentrated and optimal. Uh, what about uh, work? She had a job too, well sometimes she spoke English on the job, but sometimes it's the same thing over and over and over again. So immersion isn't always optimal input. Uh, the best kind of input, I'm gonna make the claim today, this is probably the most important sentence I'm gonna to say to you, second to my winning the weightlifting contest. This might be nearly as important. Stories. The best input, the best optimal input is stories. And the entire curriculum I'm recommending is based on stories. And we're gonna talk about stories. Stories that you hear and stories that you read, otherwise known as fiction. Fiction is the root, in my opinion. We interpret our entire lives as a narrative, as a story that we're experiencing. And we are the protagonist in this great adventure. And when we read novels, we take the part of the protagonist. We love doing this. This makes us very, very happy. Uh, I not only wanna help your teaching and your own language acquisition, but I wanna take a moment and make the same point and help your social life. Let's say you go to a party, you're invited to a party, and you get there and you realize you don't know anybody. Your friend didn't show up and this is a bunch of strangers, what do you do? tell you what to do. Think of the last three movies that you saw. You can, and let's say, the last movie you saw was of course Terminator 41. So you go up to someone and you say, I just saw Terminator 41, have you seen it? Pretty good, someone within ear, hearing range will have seen it. And you'll get into a conversation. And I'll tell you, it's gonna be an interesting conversation because people know how to talk about stories and they know how to talk about movies because it's a kind of theater and they can tell you what it's about and whether the acting was good and whether the ending was right and what they learned from it, etc. In first language, we begin with stories. Children love to hear stories. Well, most kids do. Um, the research says 95% of children 
like mommy and daddy to tell them stories. The 5% who don't, their parents don't enjoy reading to them. Isn't that too bad? Kind of heartbreaking, I think. The children who hear more stories do better in school. They do better in everything, whether they hear the stories in school or whether they hear the stories at home, etc. I had stories all around me. I had a very easy life, let me tell you. Um, stories everywhere. Mommy and daddy told me stories. My sister got me involved with stories on the radio. Can you imagine? Before Christmas, there would always be Christmas stories. And she was into it and she, she's four years older, and she helped me understand the stories and got me as excited about it as she was. She was always getting me interested in stories. I'll tell you something else about my sister. I gotta call her. Anyway, when I was nine years old, she took me to the local public library and got me a library card. That leads us to the second point. What stories do is they bring you to the point where reading is more comprehensible. Dr. Benico Mason has a method of telling stories which you may want to check out. It's very good. It's called story listening. She tells a story. She knows in advance which words will be challenging. She creates what's called a prompter. She has ways of making it comprehensible, draws a picture, explains it. The crucial part of what she did, she doesn't tell the students, remember these world, words. They don't try to study the words. They don't try to remember. They just listen to the story. That's it. That produces more gains in vocabulary than doing vocabulary exercises. I'm going to repeat that because that's so important. Hearing words through stories, and we'll see later reading words, is more efficient, more words learned per minute than actually draw a line from the word to the definition, write three sentences with every word. You're better off listening to more stories. Well, page two, reading. I'm gonna argue for self-selected reading. Before I do that, let me tell you about a stage that Dr. Mason has invented that I think is a great breakthrough. It's called guided self-selected reading. When students have heard stories and they're ready to start reading, they don't start with big novels. They don't start with authentic reading. Reading written by native speakers, designed to be read by native speakers. What she does in her English classes in Japan, she has a collection of easy books and the students read very, very easy books for two years. Wow. They're called graded readers. You know about graded readers. Books written for students acquiring a language. The Newbery series, the Longman series, et cetera, et cetera. There are lots of them out there for English. Then going to the real thing is a lot easier. No problem. I've been testing her method lately. Um, my third language, I guess it is, is Spanish, fourth language. Um, I'm okay in Spanish. I'm kind of intermediate, okay? I can have a conversation. I can do things. And I've read, I read one authentic book. It was kind of a struggle, but it was so good. I kept reading. And I decided to try Dr. Mason's method. I have a collection of graded readers in Spanish and I've been reading them. I'm home now all the time, just like most people. And I've been doing my work and all this. And yes, I'm practicing the piano. Uh, but I've been reading graded readers. I'm getting better. I'm getting better. And I know every week I take a test. I go to the supermarket. It's open on Fridays, early morning at six o'clock. You're the only ones there if you're old, old people over 60, I'm way over 60. So I do that and I check out, you know, I pay for my groceries and it's the same guy all the time. And we've gotten friendly and I speak Spanish to him. In the beginning, he was answering me in English and I told him, mi meta es hablar español como ustedes. My goal is to speak Spanish the way you do. And that melted his heart. He now speaks Spanish to me all the time. I can tell I'm getting better because he's speaking faster. And it's more idiomatic. It's much, much more complicated than it was at the beginning because I've really pumped in a lot of Spanish in the two months or so that I've been reading these graded readers. So this stuff really works. We don't acquire language by producing it. 
We acquire language by understanding it. Well, let me give you some of the research on reading. Let's say we're just about done with this stage of guided self-selected reading and we can now read authentic reading, etc. Fiction is the way. I am going to make the case for fiction. I only have about four hours left on this, so I better go quickly. Um, first of all, people say, oh, fiction, it's not very complicated. It's easy words all the time. No. Fiction has complicated words in it and a lot of it. Uh, my colleague, Claire Walter, who works with Dr. Mason, did a study of the stories she told in class. This is beginning level in French to French class compared to the vocabulary found in the same amount of time in a regular French book. The amount of time, the same. The total words, the students learn, far more words listening to stories, far more high frequency words, and far more rare words, difficult words, etc. The highest frequency, it was about the same, but still pretty good in the same percentage. My colleague Jeff McQuillan did a study recently, published in a journal called Reading Matrix. He looked at 22 novels for young people, uh, Nancy Drew, Twilight, all these things. Oh my, I, I hope you've read some of these books, what we call the young people's literature. It is so good. I fell in love with it, with Harry Potter. Um, I have this drive. If I drive into the city, Santa Monica, I go there to go to Gold's Gym and also to see my grandchildren. And I have to drive, it's half an hour each way. So it started getting boring. So I got discs, you know, recorded stories, audio books. And I get them free from the library, otherwise I can't afford them. And they're wonderful. I get detective stories. That's where I discovered John Grisham. I have no interest in law. I don't want to be a lawyer. I don't care. But his books are marvelous. They're great. So I have found the brilliant writing of everyday fiction writers, the so-called bestsellers, who write compelling, absolutely compelling novels. A good study, I like this one especially because I like science fiction. One, two researchers, Rolls and Rogers, a journal called English for Specific Purposes. They looked at one million words of science fiction. For a native speaker who can read well, that's about a year of pleasure reading. They found in those books, most of the words you find on lists of academic words in science. If you've done a year of pleasure reading of science fiction, you have probably acquired about half of the words you need to read science texts. And it didn't matter what kind of science fiction. Uh, Jeremy Moss, another one. I'm deliberately giving you a lot of data because it's so compelling. Um, this is the big pearls examination given to 40, 14 year olds, 35 different countries. Okay. The ones who read fiction were clearly better than the 15 year olds who preferred nonfiction. You do well on these standardized tests. Okay. Uh, another one, green. Everyday contemporary novels have about 90% of the vocabulary you find in textbooks. They're all there. You don't have to study them. Um, reading fiction really pays off with vocabulary. I want to give you a couple of studies, first language and second language. And I'll, the third one I'll give you is one you can do at home as soon as you're done listening to me. Uh, a study done in the United Kingdom in London, researchers from London University have been following the same group of children, same group of people since they were children. They've been studying them for over 40 years. And every few years, they give them tests to see how they're progressing. These are volunteers, and the tests aren't difficult. The last time they did it, the people were 43 years old. These are native speakers of English. They gave them a test of English vocabulary. The best predictor, how much fiction you're reading. Better than nonfiction. How about that? That is amazing. And it didn't matter how good your vocabulary was when you're 15. It matters how much you're reading now. So when I get to be 42, I'm going to start reading fiction. Here's a second language study done by Benico Mason. And my goal is to make this a very famous study because it deserves some publicity. Uh, Dr. Mason, as I told you, 
uh, teaches English, or she retired last year, at a university in Japan. And one of the classes she taught was open to anyone who wanted to be in it. Uh, it was an English conversation, introduction to English. And the class was stories, as you imagine. The homework was reading graded readers. After the semester was over, several of her students came up to her and said, uh, we would really like to continue. We want to continue reading. Can you guide us and help us? She said, fine, I'll do it under one condition. You take different versions of the TOEIC test, one at the beginning, one later. Some of you have heard of the TOEIC test. It's a very famous test of English as a foreign language. I like to say that in Asia, they have TOEIC fever. They're very interested in TOEIC. There's one guy in Japan. He gets his name in the newspaper every year. He takes the TOEIC and he gets 100% every time and he's like a national hero. I think this guy has too much time on his hands. You ought to find something that's a contribution to the human race. Anyway, here's what she found. She had the students write down what they read too. From looking at her charts, we were able to estimate how much time they took in their reading. The TOEIC test is from zero to a thousand. If you score 250, you're ready to start reading. And that's what her students were at when they started that or a little higher. Here's the incredible result. For every hour they read, they gained about three quarters of a point on the TOEIC. Now you multiply that if you read 100 hours, 200, if you read 200 hours in two years, you can go from the bottom of the TOEIC all the way to the top, to the absolute highest level. Now, usually what people do is they take an expensive TOEIC preparation course and they have to, you know, do exercises and study and take tests. Oh, this really hit me a few years ago. I was at my favorite restaurant, McDonald's. And I was sitting outside, the chairs outside, and it was just me just looking around. I was going in to see my dad and he wasn't available for the next 10 minutes. And there was this kid next to me, obviously a high school student also sitting around. And on his desk, he had a vocabulary workbook. It was obviously homework for a class. He couldn't care at all. He could care less. He had no look, interest looking at it. I thought, and he was doing nothing, just letting the time. What would happen if he had a good novel? He would have been building his vocabulary and having a pretty good time. Now, if we compare self-selection and assigned reading, very, very interesting, okay? Um, there's a wonderful quote, I'll give you the common sense of it, by a guy named Garrison Keeler. Garrison Keeler was a, a humorist who gave talks on the radio, et cetera. And he made this wonderful quote about getting gifts. He says, as a former English major, I'm a sitting duck for gift books. I'm an easy target. And for the past few years, I've gotten Dickens, Thackeray, Smollett, Richardson, Emerson, Keats, Boswell, and the Brontes. All of them great, capital G. None of them ever read by me. All of them now on my shelf, looking at me and making me feel guilty. When you get a gift book, do you read it? Not very often, because it's not self-selected and it's a signed reading, because your friend's gonna say, how did you like the book I gave you? I've, I've asked a lot of people if they like getting books as gifts. Most people don't. I, I mean, they, they don't even like when people recommend books. I've just read this great book. You've got to read it, you've got to read it. No, it's got to be something you want to read. I accept recommendations from only one person. This one person, when he suggests a book, I go out and read it immediately because he knows me better than I know myself. He knows what I'm going to like. He knows what I should read. And that's my son. So every time he says something, I go out and read it and he's always right. But most of the time, no. And I hope the person is not going to ask me if I read the book. Okay. Uh, C and Lee uh, did a study of Taiwanese students of English as a foreign language. Very clear study here. One group did, so, they both did, they both read fiction. One group did assigned reading. The other the books teachers thought they'd like. 
the other self-selected reading. They got to choose. The books were about of equal difficulty. The self-selected reader acquired far more ordinary vocabulary and just as much complicated vocabulary. So it's just as good, if not better. Self-selection, in my opinion, I don't want to overstate this, but this is how, what I think is so, leads self-selection of fiction leads to life success. Here are some examples. A guy named Simonton, Dean Key Simonton, my favorite writer on, uh, on creativity. He is the master of creativity research. His conclusion, how do people become geniuses? Omnivorous reading in childhood and adolescence correlates positively with ultimate adult success. Jeffrey Canada. Jeffrey Canada was a hero in New York system of education. He founded a program that kind of like tough love, work hard kids, but that's not what happened to him. He wrote a book and talked about his education. He grew up in poverty and had no books at home, very few. Couldn't afford books in a bookstore, public library far away. He borrowed books from a friend of his and his mother was a reader and his mother gave him books when she finished. He says, quote, my strong reading background allowed me to have an easier time of it in most of my classes. Why doesn't he do it in his schools? I don't know. I've called his schools, I haven't gotten anywhere. Next one's my favorite, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Murray. She was the star of a TV special, a heroic story. The special was called Breaking Night. And her story, she grew up in really deep poverty in New York City um, and eventually went to Harvard, graduated to Harvard, wrote a book, appeared on TV, etc. Let me tell you what she did. Her father had a very interesting habit. He would go to all the local libraries, get a library card, and take out all the books he could and never returned any of them. This is before libraries were connected by computers. He could get away with it. His house was filled with fugitive library books from all over the city. Elizabeth Murray didn't like school. She only came to school the last couple of weeks to see what was on the final exams and then skipped it, didn't like it, it was boring. She read the whole time. She generously read her, from her father's book collection uh, and books that she had managed to steal from libraries. Um, here she says, I'll give it her words. Any formal education I received came from the few days I spent in attendance in school, mixed with knowledge I absorbed, from random readings of my or daddy's ever-growing supply of unreturned library books. As long as I still showed up steadily the last few weeks of class to take the test, I kept squeaking by from grade to grade. This shows that the random self-selected reading that she did gave her all the knowledge that she needed to barely, to kind of get through school. She wasn't the best student, she didn't know it was on the list, but it was enough to get her through school. It absolutely worked. Well, I want to cover a few points that are sensitive ones when we mention things like self-selected reading. The issues that come up, the very common one, if you let children read their own books, aren't they gonna just read easy books? They won't go to hard books. Turns out that's not true. When you do studies, we did a study of this in the, United, in the United States, and my colleagues and I also did a study of this in China. They continue to read. They read other books. They don't stop at easy books. They go on and on and on. What they're looking for in books is books that are interesting. Not books that are easy, but books that are interesting. Um, other studies have shown you allow kids to select books. The books they choose are at their reading level or above it. They rarely choose books that are below your reading level. They're going for the meaning. So they get to read, they get interested in more things. Self-selected reading means narrow reading. Remember the English literature course you took in school? They were very careful to make sure you read a variety. 
you should read some 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, 21st century, 20th century, and all this. You should know some, have some poetry, have some short stories, uh, one play by Shakespeare. In, in other words, this is the, the different curriculum that we have, where it's not narrow, it's broad. You should read all kinds of things. No. Narrow reading is the answer. The studies pack, uh, back this up. Linda Lame, back in 1976, good readers in English read more books by a single author and they read more series books like Harry Potter. Book one, book two, they go on to the next. Oh boy, my favorite study done by my student, Kyung Suk Cho. In the United States, some of you may know about these, the very popular book, a series of books for kids, meant for girls, for fourth, uh, second, third, fourth graders, called the Sweet Valley High series. It's about these twins, Elizabeth and Jessica, and Elizabeth is really, really nice. She's a sweetheart. Jessica is just awful. And Elizabeth and Jessica are identical twins. So you can see, this is a never ending source of plots. We asked, um, Kim Sook asked a number of her friends, she knew a lot of Koreans who wanted in the United States who wanted to improve their English. She had tried them out on Sweet Valley High, starting with the easiest, uh, Sweet, Valley, uh, Sweet Valley Twins, uh, Sweet Valley Kids, that's the second grade reader. And when the people got it, some of them started reading, others, it was beneath their dignity. It wasn't serious enough. Well, they're lost. Her people read Sweet Valley Kids, read Sweet Valley Twins at the fourth grade level, and went on to Sweet Valley High School in the fifth and sixth level. They got excited about the characters and wanted to know what was going to happen to them next. There's also a university series, which I haven't looked at, and it's a series when you grow up. I think someday they're going to have Sweet Valley after death. What happens then? Okay, are the twins still together? Uh, sell some more books that way. Guess what? The reading improved. They were amazed. Their friends said, you must be taking an English class. No. All they were doing was reading these series books that had very interesting plots. Um, my case, I'll tell you a little about me. Uh, all this applies to me. Uh, as I mentioned to you before, uh, I have had an easy life. I have had every possible advantage. And that meant I was surrounded by books. And I had parents who encouraged reading, liked reading. They never said, please go read. But the books were always there. And that was what people were doing and enjoying it, etc. It all began <clears throat> when I was in second grade and then third grade. I had come to school with a good preparation. And I was doing okay, but I wasn't in the top reading group. I was in the low reading group. Now, everybody else in the school had the same advantages that I did. So everybody was better, all right? Or they were at least as good as better. And I told my dad about it and he said, I have the solution. We went to the comic book store. My dad let me buy all the comic books I wanted. And eventually when I was finished with those, he said, Stephen, you could have all you want, go get some more, take all the money I've got, buy comic books. That made the difference. But going around at that time, I've, I've lived through eras where people have said whatever I was doing was bad for me. Uh, comics was one of these things. A book came out at the same time when I was reading comics called Seduction of the Innocent. Seduction of the Innocent said, comic books are responsible for juvenile delinquency. The guy who did it was a New York psychiatrist, MD, PhD, all this stuff. And he had done studies. Find you go to children's room, if they're in trouble with the police, you'll find comic books. He says he's done that. Well, you know, the problem with that is there were comic books in everybody's room. Everybody, during that, that was the golden age of comic books in the 1940s. Now you know how old I am when I was reading comics. Everybody, 90% of children were reading comic books. So of course, bad kids, good kids, all reading comics because everybody was. It's like saying, you go into their bathroom, you find soap. Hmm. Soap is the cause of juvenile delinquency. Same kind of dumb logic. And that was the era 
of superheroes. That was the beginning of Superman, the first great superhero. It started in the early 1940s and is still around. The comic books took, and the comic books then were pretty good. I read Batman, I read Superman, I liked them, they were okay. Comics took a great leap forward in 1960. Most of you know what happened. That was the beginning of the Marvel Comic Book Company, founded by Stan Lee, L-E-E. -E. Stan Lee invented superheroes with problems, real problems. His most famous superhero, of course, Spider-Man. Everybody knows about Spider-Man. In my opinion, Spider-Man is one of the most important literary figures in English literature and in, English, in literature throughout the world now. Let me tell you a little about Spider-Man. Uh, Spider-Man's real name is Peter Parker, and he was just an ordinary, nerdy kind of guy. Also, he liked science, and he was always experimenting with science in his bedroom. He was accidentally bitten by a spider that was radioactive because of one of his experiments. And that gave him superpowers. The ability to hang upside down from the ceiling, the jump and all these things. He first used his superpowers for his own selfish ends. He became a carnival performer. He put on shows, made good money, and didn't care about other people. And then one day he was on his way home and there was a robber holding up a couple for their money. Spider-Man or Peter Parker had all these superpowers and he could have stopped them. He said, it's not my problem. Wrong. That same burglar, the same criminal who held up that couple, murdered Peter Parker's uncle, the man who raised him as a father. No man is an island. Spider-Man has said, no matter how many people I bring to justice, I will never make up for this problem, for this error, etc. And he became a do-gooder, trying to bring all criminals to justice, rid the world of crime, um, etc. So he had several problems. Well, his uncle was another one. Another problem was his job. Oh gosh, newspaper reporter. Uh, the, his boss was terrible. Had an anti-Spider-Man idea and wanted everyone to write articles against Spider-Man, who's a total menace. And here's Peter Parker, who's really Spider-Man, trying to do this. He was a photographer. He was paid by the picture. This is what we call piecework. Okay, not very good. And he had girlfriend problems. He probably still does. He and Mary Jane went together, broke up, misunderstanding, back and forth, problems, problems everywhere. I got to tell you a little bit about my favorite Spider-Man comic book. This is Peter Parker, The Amazing Spider-Man, 1985. I still have a copy. At the end of the comic, Spider-Man has to go on a mission. And the mission, he discovers a problem he's going to solve. A young man named Donnie has a sister who needs kidney transplant immediately or she's going to die. So you have to find the closest relative you can. This is his twin sister, fraternal, brother and sister, but close enough. So Spider-Man reads about the story and he goes out to try to find Donnie. He finally finds Donnie. Donnie's on a roof, about to jump. Donnie is a depressive with serious problems. He says, I can't take it anymore. I'm gonna kill myself. Spider-Man reaches out, says, Donnie, wait. He's, he's, Donnie's too far away for his web shooter, you know, to drag him back, couldn't do it. Anyway, says, Donnie, don't jump. Donnie looks back, sees Spider-Man, says, I'm going to jump and you can't stop me. I've got problems I just can't face and I'm going to jump. Besides, he says, you're a superhero. You don't have problems. Spider-Man looks at Donnie and he says, I've got problems. You think life is easy behind this mask? And he thinks of all his problems. You think because I'm a superhero, I don't have problems? And then he says in words that will live forever in comic book literature, he says, Donnie, life is problems. It's problems for all of us every day, nonstop. And we grow by facing our problems and trying to solve them 
not by running away. It's pretty heavy for a comic book, I think. So Donnie says, okay, for my sister. He comes down off the ledge. They go to the hospital. They do the transplant immediately. They save her life. And Peter Parker visited the sister and he's leaving the hospital. And he's thinking, well, this one turned out okay. But Donnie's still depressed. And there's not much I can do about that. What's the point? You can't solve everybody's problems. He did his best for the brief moment. He was part of her life, but he can't do it all. That's what's in problems today. The entire Marvel universe, and it's, 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 it's gotten over to DC as well. Superman, Batman, they have matured a great deal under the influence, under the influence of Stan Lee and, um, and Marvel Comics. So that's what we're getting today. This is heavy stuff, gang. Well, a couple more things, a few more dividends, and then I'll stop. Uh, phonics, I'm sorry, phonics, comics, oh gosh, what an error. Comics will give you all these things. It will give you vocabulary, uh, reading rather, fiction will give you vocabulary, grammar, writing style, all these things come from reading, especially fiction. But there are other advantages. Um, I just saw this in an article written in about a year ago, I saw this in the, in the Guardian. The Guardian's a major British newspaper. And the Guardian interviewed Barack Obama. And they asked him if he read fiction. He said, oh, absolutely. Quite a contrast with uh, Donald Trump, let me tell you. Anyway, by the way, I feel it is my oblig obligation as a loyal American citizen to criticize the president. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt said this and said, it is traitorous not to criticize presidents when they're wrong. So I'm simply doing my responsibility. Uh, anyway, ah, going back to Barack Obama, they asked Barack Obama, what do you read? He said, I read fiction, a lot of fiction. What do you get out of it? Obama's response was as if he had just finished reading the research, exactly what the research was saying. He said, I have learned from reading a lot of fiction that when I meet someone who seems very different, there's still a lot of him that I can understand, that I can empathize with them, okay? If I get to know him a little bit. Also, Obama says, said, I have learned to distrust easy solutions. What seem obvious is more complicated than meets the eye. If you've read Murder on the Orient Express, you know all about this. You see all the problems people go through, um, etc. So the researchers said the same thing. It gives you a capacity to empathize and what the researchers call a greater tolerance for vagueness, for living with uncertainty, for not jump, jumping to simple, easy solutions. Well, I'm going to close with my full all-out criticism of Donald Trump. I know this wasn't what you bargained for. I'm going to say it anyway, because I have tenure and I can't be fired. And also, it's part of my talk, and I want to make certain points with it. Uh, this was in the Washington Post. A series of articles came out about three years ago uh, about Trump's spelling problems. As everybody knows, he's not a good speller. And when he writes tweets, he likes to write tweets all night, uh, hours and hours, he makes spelling mistakes. And the Post, the Washington Post criticized him for it. And people wrote in defending President Trump, saying, why are you worried about spelling? All he needs is someone to proofread and he'll be fine. You're making a, a whole big deal out of something that's very trivial and ordinary. I wrote a letter to the Post. I kept it short. You can follow it. You can find it on my website, sdcrashen.com. Uh, and in the letter, I said, spelling might reveal a serious underlying pathology. Our research shows that a lot of spelling comes from reading. Good readers are not always perfect spellers. Nobody is in English, I'll tell you that. But good readers are pretty good spellers. I'll tell you what happens with you and me when we spell. When I'm writing, if I'm writing like, you know, 500 words, a short paper, a letter, at least once I'll stop and be an unsure of a word. I'll then look it up on the spell check. The spell check lets you choose from four different options. I always know which one is right because I got a feel for spelling from doing so much reading. So spelling, reading gives you a tremendous amount of spelling and it gives you a feeling 
for those that you haven't quite acquired yet. So readers do a lot better than non-readers on spelling tests. It's really, really no comparison. But reading, as I've talked about, gives you other things as well. Reading gives you vocabulary, gives you grammar, gives you good writing style, style et cetera, et cetera. Not only that, we see that reading gives you knowledge. Studies have come out. This is from Keith Stanovich at the University of Michigan. These are adults, but readers know more than non-readers. They know more about everything. They know more about literacy, that makes sense. They know more about history. They know more about science. They know more about practical matters. All comes from reading, and most of it is reading fiction. My dear cousin Evelyn now knows a lot about the law from having a good time and reading fiction. That's where it comes from, and that's what I'm pushing. We're pushing back against, I'm not, I'm not against nonfiction, of course. Uh, by the way, I don't write fiction. People say that I do, but I really don't. Uh, I write all nonfiction. I don't, and I read a lot of nonfiction, of course, part of my profession, but I owe so much of it to my background in reading fiction, especially the years of science fiction. Uh, I try to read in other languages, a little footnote, and I'm always looking for science fiction. Uh, it's pretty hard to find. I've had a little luck with French. Oh, I want to tell you a little more about my reading and what happened. It's uh, good data, I think. Uh, I found one writer in French who writes science fiction, uh, Bernard Weber, which is very, very good. He wrote a series of books about ants where you're part of the ant's life. They throw me fascinating. So I read his stuff. I try to read in other languages, but I don't always get what I want. So I'm always looking for good science fiction in, in other languages. For the most part, when I find it, I start making progress again. In my case, I started with, with comic books. And then when I got a little older, I got interested in sports fiction. When you're young, you're interested in sports. When I was you know, 9, 10, 11, I was growing up in Chicago, and my whole life was worshiping the Chicago baseball team, the Chicago Cubs. Went to the games, watched the games on television, listened to them on the radio. I was a terrible baseball player, but it didn't matter. And I found baseball fiction. I got a good story to tell you about that. I found one author. I read a book by him. His name is John Tunis, T-U-N-I-S. And the book was called The Kid from Tompkinsville. But a young man who joins a professional baseball team and does very well the first year. He's a pitcher, okay? Wins all his games. He slips in the shower, damages his elbow. He can't pitch anymore, but he can play other positions. He changes positions, comes back as an outstanding baseball player again. He rises up, has more misfortune. He's drafted into the military, serves in World War II, was a prisoner of war, escapes, has numerous injuries from being in the war comes back, plays on the Dodgers again, overcomes all this. The book is always up and down, problems, solutions. One critic said, the kid from Tompkinsville is the book of Job for boys. I read it when I was 10 years old. I read it again when I was in my 20s. I read it again when I was in my 40s, and I reread it in my 70s. Um, I just, uh, I ran into my former doctor at the hospital once, a guy I really, I really had a good time when we, I did the visit and he said, Steve Krashen, so good to see you. He says, you're the only patient I want to see again because he wanted to talk about baseball. My doctor, Dr. Pearl, wonderful man, loved to talk about the baseball, the Dodgers. We started having coffee. We, we kept having coffee till the coronavirus came. I gave him the kid from Tompkinsville. He loved it. Together, Dr. Seymour Pearl and I met for six months reading these books, 10 books by the same author, all about baseball, all about life and how to live and how to be a good person, how to be impeccable, how to take life seriously, etc. This is sports fiction for kids and it's all there, philosophy and language, everything you'd ever need. My, then that led to science fiction. My true curriculum when I was in school were these books. I took literature classes, we all did, and we read Charles Dickens. I don't even remember what the books were. 
uh, read John Steinbeck. None of them penetrated. I passed the tests. That's all. I remember every single one of these self-selected books, every one. And I like to talk about them. They really change me. They're important. And I reread it. We need not to reject nonfiction. Keep nonfiction. Nonfiction is wonderful. But don't neglect the wonderful glory of fiction. A good book about reading fiction is called Lost in a Book by Victor Nell, N-E-L-L. -L, and it's about going into a trance when you read fiction. And brilliant research all about it. And being into another world. When you read fiction, again, you become the main character. You go through all the problems. You have to make the decisions, etc. You read 20 books. You've gone through 20 lifetimes. You really get to know people. Okay, I'm going to stop here. And I'm told that people have penetrating questions for me to try to answer. And I will do my best. All right. Wow. Um, thank you so much, Professor Krashen. That talk is, and I'll borrow your words, compelling and rich. Indeed. Very good. The best, right. the, the best visual aid is ourselves. And without a doubt, the best linguistic model is best spelled as S-T-E-P-H-E-N. That means first stories are the best optimal input. T, the best way to establish tolerance in vagueness is reading fiction. Effective input should not only be comprehensible, but also compelling and rich. And hearing words through stories, reading words through stories are efficient way in language acquisition. Producing language may not help much in language acquisition, but listening and reading does. Reading do. Um, encouraging reading fiction can help vocabulary acquisition more than any vocabulary exercises. And last, and this is my favorite point, navigating life is indeed challenging, but the answer may just be sitting in one of the bookshelves waiting for you to open, and that will lead you to life success. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk, Professor Krashen. We will now be opening the question and answer portion. And I would like to invite my um, co-committee co with, with me here. Let's start with um, Jack. All right. So the first question is, how is plus one in the comprehensible input measured? It isn't. We know it's there, though. The criticism of my work, one of many, 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 has been, how do you identify I plus one? How do you know it's there? We don't. We have hypothesized it as an abstract idea, and it makes predictions. The predictions are always met. This is how we do science. For example, we do science with a lot of concepts that we can't really make concrete, like anger. People get angry when they do thus and thus. Well, the cure for anger is meditation. You'll feel better. How do you measure anger? Well, they don't do that in every study. They use a common sense idea. They make predictions and they see if the predictions come out to be true. Our prediction about I plus one, and Jack, you're gonna love this. If input is optimal, if it's comprehensible, compelling, rich, and abundant, I plus one is always there, even if you can't always identify it because that's where we see that people make progress. So I can't answer the question, but I don't have to, because it makes the right predictions. Wonderful, thank you so much. Let's have the next question, Bam. Yes, the next question is, uh, Professor Krashen uh, uh, just said that we can stop acquiring language, so what, about the issue of language for stylization. Does it mean that our brain stops acquiring good language structure? Oh, the big fossilization controversy. Good for you. It's a good question. Good questions are defined as those I have thought about and I have an answer ready, okay? I am amazed at how little fossilization there is. That people who come to the United States, for example, after a few years, are pretty good. I did a paper, by the way, which you can find on my website, sdcrashen.com. Operators are standing by. Um, I did a paper on Arnold Schwarzenegger. I met Arnold, actually, on Venice Beach weightlifting, because he used to come down and lift with us. 
very nice guy, very pleasant. You probably heard that about him. Um, his English was wonderful. And when you hear him give a speech when he was governor, phenomenal English, wonderful. He has a little accent. That's it. Everything else, I would say his grammar is 99% perfect. Take a look at what people can do, not what they can't do. Mm -hmm. Now, I do have a theory of accent, which I'll give to you very briefly. I maintain that accent doesn't fossilize. That if you relax, you will find the perfect accent is there inside you. My prediction is that if I talk to Arnold and we have a few drinks or whatever, which we have never done, his accent will become as good as mine in English, or I'll be able to speak German the way he can. We don't use our best accents because we feel silly. It's embarrassing. It's not us. We're not members of the group that use that accent. We don't feel we're 100%. It's kind of like clothing. Uh, clothing has two functions. One function is to protect you from the weather. The other is to say who you are, what social group you belong to, okay? And if you're not quite dressed correctly, you feel kind of funny being overdressed or underdressed. Same thing with accent. You want the accent that is right for you. Um, I have a the language I'm best in is German. I have a pretty good German accent. I could fool some people for about three sentences, and then, you know, something will slip, okay? And uh, the perfect German accent, though, is inside me. I know it's there. Because if I'm fooling around like you, if I'm singing a song, telling a joke, fooling around, the accent is perfect. Let me give you one example from my life. I did some research. I, did, I lived in Canada for a few months, University of Ottawa, and I went back up later to confer with some of my former colleagues. We were writing papers together. Uh, one paper we did was in English, one was in French. And I was in charge of both meetings. And the meeting that we discussed, the French paper, we did in French, and I chaired the meeting. We're in a modest size room. There's enough room there. And the people I was there with were people I was extremely confident with and comfortable with. My French teacher, I always went to her class. It was a lot of fun. My friend Hubert, who spoke English perfectly, but you never heard him speak English. He was in favor of French. And his kids would never let him speak. Uh, he never let his kids speak English, one of those. And he and I, his two daughters and my two kids, would go roller skating every Saturday. That's the kind of people I was with. Okay, my co-authors, my colleagues. So I was, I was doing a fine job with French. Then the door opened. A stranger walked in. And I thought, oh gosh, I'm probably making every mistake possible. My accent, my good French accent disappeared. My grammar got worse. I was thinking these, this stranger is judging me, which is probably not true. Another time, again, I'm telling you these anecdotes because the same thing has happened to you. I was having coffee in Paris. My daughter was with me in with a colleague who was at the, the Sorbonne. First time I had met her, we'd corresponded. Uh, we spoke French, and her research was wonderful. I really wanted to know what she was doing. And when we finished, my daughter would come over occasionally. She was a very young child at the time. She was playing video games. Now she's 50, good grief. Anyway, she'd come over and say, Daddy, I was listening to you. She was, my daughter was going to a French school at the time. Your French was really good. Your accent was wonderful. You're fluent. Because I was comfortable. I was with a member of my own club another linguist who was not interested in how well I spoke. She was interested in the subject we were talking about. Um, Steve Kaufman says, that's the great principle. People are not judging you when you're speaking another language. They're interested in what you're saying, not how you're saying it. That allows you to join the club and relax. So I'm saying there, I suspect, this is a conjecture. I suspect there is no fossilization at all. That's my suspicion given enough input, and given complete comfort, okay? Mm -hmm. And notice also that some rules that are late acquired in language, for example, English, the third person singular, um, uh, subject verb agreement, all these things make no contribution to communication. They're markers of social group. That's what they are. So the more we relax, the easier they'll come. So this is work in progress. I don't have the data to back it up, but I think it's worth a conjecture. 
And if I'm wrong, we make progress. So what? That's very insightful, Professor Krashen. Thank you so much. Um, Bom, let's have the next question. The next question is about fan fiction. Would your definition of fiction also extend to fan fiction? Would this often non-edited fiction created by fans have a similar impact? I have read fan fiction. I was a big follower of Star Trek. And sometimes fans would submit scripts and some of them were accepted. And I remember seeing them and they were absolute first class. So there's no difference in terms of the authenticity. It is the real stuff. I think it's absolutely fascinating. So continue on. Thank you so much. Um, Jack, let's have the next question. Can you recommend others that narrate good stories? What's your favorite storybook to date? Oh gosh, it's kind of, you know that song, when I'm not with the girl I love, I love the girl I'm with. When I'm not, when, when every story I'm reading, every episode of good TV is my favorite. It's whether I can go into trance and become one with the movie, with the book. We saw the last really fine movie I saw was the, oh gosh, the musical movie. What's the name? We Are the Champions. Tell me what's the name of the group. Can't remember. Getting old. We saw that movie. My wife and I just sat there and stared for the next 10 minutes. We couldn't move. At the moment, that was my favorite movie. Yeah, Queen, of course. Thank you. So I can't really say what my favorite is. It keeps changing all the time, and that's wonderful. We're always looking for variety. I think Queen changed me as a person. No question. And they all do. They all give you new experiences. I thought the story was remarkable, and the music was absolutely brilliant. Okay. And I'll find someone else. I'll find something else. Good question. Thank you so much. Let's have Bam. Yes, the question is from Kun On Uma, and she asks that it seems like uh, fiction could also be interpreted as subtitle movies. Is it correct? Could be interpreted as what? Subtitled subtitle movies. Subtitle movies. Oh, yeah. I have not really studied that. A lot of people have mentioned it. Um, I think that, yeah, it works. I would guess that it would work. It's going to be comprehensible input. Uh, you're watching a movie, let's say in Spanish, and there's Spanish subtitles. And that gives you, and you're intermediate Spanish. When I watch a Spanish movie, I'm intermediate. It's great to be intermediate in some languages, really get the, the right feeling. Uh, I can't understand authentic conversational, very fast, idiomatic Spanish. But in a movie, I can always understand the subtitles. So it does help. I wonder whether it's abundant enough, whether there's enough of it. Because if I read a Spanish novel, I think I can go faster. I think I can get more words pumped in in the same amount of time. But again, I don't know of any research on this. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Let's have the next question. Bam. To balance the acquisition and the learning of the language itself, is it enough just to read a lot um, especially the fiction, like doing an extensive reading, or should we do a rich follow-up activity? Great question. I've been waiting for that one. Thank you. No, I would do more reading. Follow-up activities are basically traditional language teaching. They're either traditional language teaching or they're output. You know, tell the story again. Tell the story pretending you're the main character or you're the second character, all right. Change all the verbs to present tense. It's either conscious learning or it's output practice. Output is the result of language acquisition, not the cause. Um, and go to my website, sdcrashen.com, download a paper called Down with Forced Speech. You'll see the data. Thank you so much. Let's have Jack. Okay. As an educator, how would you promote fiction reading, which is usually long to the present generation of students, heavily accustomed to reading social media texts, which are short, such as tweets, Facebook posts, and Instagram captions? Not to mention they are also distracted by 
online activities such as TikTok and blogging, among others. If it's compelling, they won't be bored. You'd go to a really fantastic movie. They don't say, well, I've been sitting here 10 minutes. I'm bored. No, if the movie's great, they're going to stay with it. Okay? It depends on the quality of the activity. If the book is really fantastic, you want a book where they won't move, that it's so good, they can't wait. That, that's the uh, big advantage of Goosebumps. Goosebumps, books written for kids. Um, my goodness, Goosebumps moves you along from chapter to chapter better than any book I've ever read. The last page of every chapter, you must turn the page. And then the door opened and, ah, a scream. You want to see what it was. So you want books that carry you along. And then you won't be bored. You won't be distracted. You say, leave me alone. I'm reading. That's what we're looking for. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Let's go back to Bam. Yes, the question is how fiction influenced children and character in their language use? How fiction influences... Tell me again. Yeah, how fiction influences the learners. How does it influence people? Yes, in language use. In language use. Oh, I think they pick up a lot of language use. Uh, a lot of the common everyday language. See, fiction has a lot of expository prose. It has narration and it has lots of dialogue, especially in another language. It's a very nice place of getting a great deal of comprehensible input that you're going to need. You cannot get through fiction without dialogue. It comes all the time. So this is all around good tool that can use, be used for lots and lots of purposes. You guys, what I recommend is you do what I've done, and I'm sure most of you have done this already. The best thing you can do is to work on other languages. You guys are experts in your native language in English, Thai and English, and maybe some others, languages you grew up with. Have a third language, have a fourth language. Suffer with it. Go to a class and then try it on your own. Try different things. The last, oh gosh, 50 years, over 60 years of my life, 70 years by now, I have been working with other languages. I have been every day working with a language that is not spoken around me. And you get these insights. That's when I got excited about fiction. That's when I saw the real value. You get into a fiction book, if it's, if it's good, you get lost in the book and you get drawn into the story you don't want to leave. That's the big advantage. That doesn't happen with traditional instruction. Thank you so much. Let's listen to the question from Bum. Is there any value uh, of having fiction discussion groups in a classroom context? Not too much. Thank you for asking the right question and understanding my point. That's exactly right. Uh, discussion is basically students listening to other students, which isn't all that bad, but it's production practice. And production is the result of language acquisition, not the cause. Uh, let me, again, I want to appeal to your own experiences. I'm sure these things have happened to you. Um, I will go three years without speaking German. I go months and months without speaking French. I live in Southern California, okay? And I, f I do read though in these languages. And I find when I travel or I meet people, I have no trouble. It's because of all the input. You want fluency? Get input. It's not the speaking practice that counts. Now, discussion and writing, let me shift the topic slightly. I wanna make sure I cover this. Output does something else that's very, very different, that does not affect language acquisition. Let me first talk about writing. Writing, if you have a problem and you sit down and start to write about it, the problem gets clearer. Writing makes you smarter. Writing helps problem solving, especially if you write, go over what you write, revise, 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 you come up with new ideas. Inspiration, this is well known by authors, comes during the act of writing, not while you're taking a walk before it. 
So, I'll, and I'm sure discussion does that too, like we're doing now. I'm learning from your questions. I hope you're learning something from me. We're having a discussion. I'm growing from concentrating on these questions and hearing your questions and realizing that these are good questions to investigate. So discussion and writing are good for thinking. Thank you so much. Let's listen back from Jack. In reading, it is important to have I plus one as the input. What do you think about I minus one in extensive reading? I would not ever worry about either of them. If you read a book and it's compelling, if it seems real easy, you think you know everything already, if you're reading for meaning, you're getting new stuff. You're getting slightly different shades of meanings of some words. You might pick up a word here and there. It's not a waste of time. I plus one, you don't even have to think about. If it's comprehensible, there's enough of it, it's gonna be there. And even if it seems too easy, <clears throat> I've been reading these easy Spanish books every day now. Some that I have the impression I really know all this, I'm getting better. I am really getting better. I'm getting lots more input. I'm getting shades of meaning that I didn't quite realize before I hear myself saying things. So don't worry about it. Keep reading. Thank you. Let's have Bam back. Yes, the question is, uh, you mentioned earlier about TOEIC tests and how obsessed Asians are with the TOEIC exam. So how would you convince these people that the fiction would help them improve their English? Oh, I don't know. You're asking me to do public relations. I haven't been very good at this. I've <laughs> doing this for 40 years and I haven't succeeded yet. I'm still arguing with people. Uh, in the, by the way, in terms of obsession, uh, the United States is just as bad. We don't have TOEIC fever, but we certainly have scholastic aptitude testing. We have, we have TOEFL testing. The TOEFL industry is making billion. I'm going to put them out of business. My goal is to force these people to make an honest living and sell things that people need. I would love to put all the testing companies out of business, all the test prep companies. It's not a good way to make a living. It's not helping anybody. It's sending the message that conscious study is the way, but the theory hasn't gotten around yet. That's why I'm giving all these webinars, okay? I'm counting on you, okay? Uh, how do we convince people? I hope I can get Justin Bieber. <laughs> Someone that kids will listen to. Someone who'll say, I read all this book and it was great, man. It was great. It's me, the Bieber. You do what I do. Uh, but, and I'm not the one to make that happen. Okay. I hope one of you will tell your favorite rock star or find a rock star that loves reading and make sure that person tells everybody. What I liked about Star Trek when it was on, it's now on pay TV and I can't afford to watch pay TV. Anyway, there would be a scene where the captain of the Enterprise would be sitting, reading a book. That's it. None of this in your face. You know, you've got to read and blah, blah. Just reading a book and enjoying it. So that, that's what I'm, that's, that will send the message, I think, eventually. Um, if you, we did a couple of studies about this a few years ago again, both in Chinese and English, we asked students, uh, elementary school students, like 10, 11, 12 years old, how much reading do you do? How much reading do your classmates do? Every study, people felt they were reading more than their classmates, which is impossible because it was the same group. We don't see people reading, so we assume people are not reading. People are reading and we should keep the bookstores going. Let me get now to my big point. Libraries, libraries, libraries. The libraries are being are really suffering now because the, you know they're not open, they've closed up, which means circulation is, is awkward. And the kids most hurt by this are children of poverty. Their only source of books is the library. So if we're gonna do something about all this and make fiction you know, popular, Support libraries, support libraries, support libraries. I've written about 10 letters to the editor since the co coronavirus has begun. Uh, I quote Isaac Asimov, the science fiction writer, and says that when we cut library funding, the United States has found another way of committing suicide. And that's really true. 
supporting libraries, I think, is the best way to raise reading and fiction to, to give it more respect. And then people who read a lot will do fine in these exams and they'll feel it, they'll know it. They'll whiz right through it. Thank you so much. Let's have Bam, Win Bam. The next question asks for a su suggestion from Professor Carson. Is it okay um, to let students in an ESL classroom to read the stories or the fictions from Wattpad or Goodreads? I haven't read any. I haven't had time. So, but if they're compelling, if they're interesting and kids like them, what's the problem? Right. Thank you. Um, Jack? Could you recommend any enrichment activities that teacher could use in second language classroom? Or tell a story. <laughs> more reading, more stories. That's the curriculum. I, if it doesn't fit perfectly, into our classroom schedule, we've got to change what school looks like. Frank Smith put it this way. We have school and we have the human brain and they work differently. Which one can we change? Can we change the brain to make it fit school or can we change school to make it fit the brain? Our challenge is to change school. Beautiful, thank you so much. It's a very good one. Um, Bam, let's listen again to you. Yes, the question is how we deal with students who have had negative reading experience and that now make them anxious to engage with fiction. Right, easier, more compelling reading, lots of stories. Comic books, comic books, magazines, light reading, lots of it. Thank you so much. Let's have Bum. I think this will be the last question. Right. How to make our students change their interest from easy topic in comic to another heavy topic, but still in form of fiction reading? I would work with more easy comics. I would go through it rather than go around it. I would give them all the comic books they would ever want to read, and they will make progress gradually on their own. It has always worked that way. If they want to read the same comic books over, Mickey Mouse, Mickey Mouse, it's going to get boring. And they're going to move on to other things. Make sure there's a lot of access and a lot of variety freely available. What one person did is an article in Library Journal. Um, she told her high school students that if they liked a book, they could take their pen and they could put a little star in the front cover and then put it back on the shelf. Some of the books had 15, 20, 30 stars. So the other students knew what was popular. Those were the books that circulated. So I would certainly do that. Another study I'd like to talk about sometime, I should have, was called Spider-Man in the Library. A middle school, where kids are generally not interested in school, they brought graphic novels into school, into the library, but did not allow them to circulate. You had to go to the library to read the graphic novel. Library traffic nearly doubled. The amount of non-comic material taken out went up about 30%. So I would try that. I would try Spider-Man in the library and I would try the star method. All of which are cheap. <laughs> right. There's a last question. It's, it reads, last encouraging words for someone who has always loved nonfiction, but is now willing to emerge into reading fiction. If you want to, first of all, there's nothing wrong with nonfiction. I'm simply trying to give fiction some respectability. The fiction has been banished from schools, etc. It's been, or it's there with less respect. I want to give it a lot of respect. If you love nonfiction, stay with it. Don't listen to me. It's not only nonfiction, it's both. Of course, either one will do just fine. So don't worry about it. Just keep reading. All right. We have another question. It says, is a 15-minute reading diet a good start for non-readers? Yeah, it's called sustained silent reading. And the studies are pretty positive. 
<coughs> but it only works if you do certain things. Number one, teacher doesn't talk during SSR, during sustained silent reading. You leave it be very quiet. You don't interrupt, no announcements. You have a lot of books available. You don't tell kids, bring your own book, because they'll forget. Human race, I do this all the time. I forget everything all the time. Have lots of books there, tons of them. And let's say four classes are doing sustained silent reading. Each class has a classroom library. You let the students go to the other classes and choose books too. Just, um, just make it loose and easy. No book report, no summaries. Just read, put it back. If you want to talk about it with your friend, a colleague of mine, Faye Shin, uh, had this. She put aside five minutes a day, 10 minutes, different time where kids could talk about their books with each other. Fine. But you don't want noise. You want it to be quiet. So yeah, sustained silent reading can work very well. Right, very well. Um, we have, actually there's a lot of questions now. I think this is interesting. Um, are articles from professional journals good as reading materials for college freshmen? A lot of them are way beyond the student's I plus one. They're way beyond my I plus one too. I found most of them too long, too boring, and nearly incomprehensible. And we're doing something about it. What we're doing about it is I'll tell you what I'm doing and about 10 of my colleagues. We are writing only short papers, usually three, four pages. The paper that won the Nobel Prize for DNA, the double helix, was two pages, the most read and the clearest article ever, okay? We publish in free journals. They're called open access. So we write clearly, we get to the point, no long literature survey, no long conclusion, how you should do the next studies and all that. Keep it simple, keep it clear, at the same time professional. Then you have a better chance, in my opinion. For beginning college students, if they want to read and high school students, I think magazines articles are a lot better. They're much better written, etc. My favorite newspaper has always been USA Today because it's so easy to read. <laughs> it's so relaxing. So you read a few thousand of those, you're literate, it's okay. But then when you hit professional, few essayists, a few essayists are very good. Kurt Vonnegut, brilliant essays, but most of them are very boring. I'm just as bored as you are. Thank you so much. I think everyone can relate to that. <laughs> um, we have another one. How do you motivate college level students to read more fiction than watch videos? I will assume this is like, you know, YouTube videos. Number one, I would make the fiction available, which we haven't. Make it easily available in the library. Number two, let it connect to the videos. Maybe the video does have a book series, etc. They may do that. There's nothing wrong with videos. <laughs> I have to admit, uh, some videos are really first class, so I'm not opposed. I've learned my lesson on this, let me tell you. I've been writing all these articles, article after article. I've been publishing uh, more than 10 a year, most of my life, and nobody reads them. Then I discovered YouTube, and I found that's where it is. That's where people are getting their information. And I started posting things on YouTube, and I'm hoping if they want more detail, they'll look at the articles. So there's nothing wrong with YouTube. There's some very good speakers, they do very well. But make the articles, stuff that they can use to expand their knowledge, make them connect. Thank you so much. I think we've read all of the questions. Perhaps we could um, ask any last words from you, Professor Krashen. It's I never have last words. Um, stay healthy, get lots of speak, uh, get lots of sleep, and drink coffee. Coffee Thanks. is the only known medication that will cure dementia, okay? It's a major source of antioxidants. <laughs> That's my word of wisdom. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor call, Crouch. Call your mother, okay? Right. Yes. We'll definitely do. <laughs> thank you so okay. much. And thank you so much again, Professor, Professor Krashen, for your inspiring and insightful talk. We truly learned a lot. And if I may quote one of the participants to sum up this, this session is that a comprehensible input has to be clear, content-rich, 
and definitely it has to be compelling. So that's from a participant. I, I think he, she is an MA student from our program as well. So we thank you so much, Professor Krashen. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your generosity. And we also thank the Language Institute Tamasat University for their gener assistant, generous assistance in hosting this webinar session, especially to Ajahn Dr. Pim Siri. Thank you so much. And we also thank all of our participants um, for joining us today. So I would like to, to promote our next session happening on the 7th of July. This um, webinar session is going to be our sixth and it is titled Bridging the Reading Gap. And this will be delivered by Associate Professor Dr. Supong Tang Kin Sirisin. He's the Director of Language Institute and the President of Thai TESOL, along with Dr. Willie Renandia from the National Institute of Education in Nanyang Technological University. So thank you once again, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, Professor Krashen. Have a wonderful day.